Welcome back to the channel guys and to today's presentation we're going to be discussing a pneumothorax and a hemothorax. Now we're also going to dive into the treatment modalities for both a pneumothorax and hemothorax and how the body compensates for decreased O2 which is hypoxia or compromised oxygen. Lastly we are going to end with an overview of a chest tube which is involved in the treatment for both a hemo and pneumothorax. Now here is some anatomy of the respiratory system. Now at the ridge of both sides, you will see the ribs separated by intercostal muscles. Then we get to the parietal pleura, the pleural space, which is the wide pink portion, and then the actual lung. Now when a pneumothorax or hemothorax occurs, this usually is caused by a puncture of a lung or chest trauma, which leads to the accumulation of air into the pleural space or blood in the pleural space. With pneumothorax, there is air in the pleural cavity, and with hemothorax, there is blood in the pleural cavity. Keep in mind, both of these can occur at the same time due to chest trauma or some type of injury, and that is termed a hemopneumothorax, which is both air and blood within the pleural cavity. Now here's a close up of a pneumothorax. If we look at the right lung, which is the punctured lung, in this picture we see that air is escaping and due to air being very light, it ascends upward. As a result of a lung being punctured, there's going to be decreased oxygen within circulation and the body will recognize this loss of oxygen and compensate for this loss by increasing the respiratory rate, which is termed tachypnea, and due to an increased respiratory rate, this is going to increase oxygen delivery to bodily tissues or temporarily do so. So treatment for a pneumothorax is going to be oxygen therapy to maintain proper oxygenation and the insertion of a chest tube. A chest tube is going to serve to evacuate the air in the pleural space. Now where are we putting the chest tube? Well due to the fact it is a pneumothorax we are treating we know that air ascends, therefore we are putting the chest tube in the upper region or superior region of the pleural space. This is usually between the second and third intercostal. Now due to air rising, a complication of a pneumothorax, something called crepitus, which is air in the subcutaneous tissue, and this is also termed subcutaneous emphysema. Now due to air rising, if we look in the second image below, we will see a patient with puffed up eyelids, and this is due to the rising of air. So yes, there's a chance someone can have a rice crispy sounding eyelid due to a pneumothorax. Now here is a close up of a hemothorax. Unlike a pneumothorax where air was involved, when we're discussing a hemothorax, that prefix hemo, which stands for blood, this is going to represent blood within the pleural space and blood actually has a weight to it, unlike air. Therefore, it's not going to ascend, it's going to descend. It's gonna pool at the base of the pleural cavity. Now, due to the compromised lung, the body will compensate for lack of oxygen by increasing the respiratory rate. And in the case of a hemothorax, there's going to be a need to compensate even more due to the fact that blood is involved. Now, when we're discussing blood, what is blood's responsibility? What is blood made of? When blood is being lost, that means that oxygen is being lost as well, okay? Remember, iron binds oxygen molecules and red blood cells have iron attached to them. And these irons pretty much attract oxygen to be distributed amongst the body. So if we're losing this blood, this is going to cause acute anemia or loss of oxygen. Now also guys, due to the fact blood has some weight to it, if it accumulates too much in the pleural cavity, it will compress against the lung and cause it to fully collapse. That's why it's going to be very important to quickly extract that blood in the pleural space. If we don't extract it, then it will lead to a complication we will soon discuss, which is a tension pneumothorax. Now treatment is the same, we need to apply oxygen immediately to the patient to maintain oxygenation. And again, a chest tube must be used to extract the blood in the cavity. Where are we putting the chest tube? Well for air, being that air went up in a pneumothorax, we put the tube up. 
for a hemothorax. Blood pools at the base. Therefore, we're going to put the chest tube lower, usually between the fifth and the sixth intercostal space. When using the chest tube, it's going to be important to monitor blood pressure because if drainage is greater than 500 to 1500 milliliters, depending on the person, this can be considered a massive problem and can lead to hypotension. Patient is losing too much blood, too much fluid. Now, when it comes to a hemothorax, another treatment to consider is that of a blood transfusion. Why? Well, think about the fact that the patient may be losing excessive blood, leading to hemodynamic compromise or instability, which is a complication as well. So at the end of the day, we want the patient's oxygen levels maintained, both their PaO2 and SaO2. Now remember, PaO2's normal range should be between 80 to 95, and SaO2 above 95%. Now say that we don't correct a hemothorax promptly, what is the complication that can arise? Again, it's a tension pneumothorax, which we see here. Now, a tension pneumothorax is a medical emergency. Don't panic, we got this. Now, it's gonna involve the hallmark sign of a tracheal deviation. The trachea is going to be displaced, and the trachea is usually pushed to the unaffected lung, or the unaffected portion of the body. So if you have a tension pneumothorax to the left lung, and the blood accumulates so much, it's going to push that trachea to the right side of your body, tracheal deviation. Now, chest trauma can elicit other things such as a flail chest, cardiac tamponade, and both hemo and pneumothoraxes. Now, due to the blood accumulation, this blood can push against the unaffected lung and fully compress it, and that could eventually lead to a lung collapse. So again, oxygen, 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 oxygen maintenance, and blood drainage is important here as well. Now let's discuss a little more how the body compensates for compromised oxygen. At first, yes, this is a huge step in benefit. Again, as a result of low O2, the respiratory rate and possibly the heart rate will increase based on what's affected. This is going to significantly help increase oxygen delivery. Now as a result of increased respiratory rate, the patient is breathing off excessive carbon dioxide and it may be too much carbon dioxide that is gonna be exhaled. So as we exhale, we are losing CO2. If we breathe off too much, we're losing too much CO2. As a result of too much carbon dioxide loss, the body is going to lack carbon dioxide in general because we already exhaled all of it. And that's going to evoke respiratory alkalosis. Now, super, super, super important to make note of is that the body can only compensate for oxygen compromise for so long. Eventually, it will get tired of increasing the rate or increasing the heart rate. As a result of tiring now, everything is going to slow down. So that means everything that was increased, such as the heart rate and the respiratory rate, they're gonna drop. So yes, the patient started in respiratory alkalosis due to the excessive exhalation and excretion of carbon dioxide, but then due to the respiratory rate slowing down and they're tiring, this is gonna cause them to retain CO2 eventually. And that's not necessarily a problem when we need to retain CO2. It's in the case where the body can't compensate anymore where it becomes dangerous. Because say you can't compensate anymore and everything stops. Yes, we're gonna stop breathing excessively. We're gonna, our heart rate's gonna stop beating excessively. And then we're just gonna start slowing down everything, everything, everything. Once they retain CO2, this now turns respiratory alkalosis into respiratory acidosis. This is because if we're retaining excessive carbon dioxide, this is going to make us hypercapnic. Hyper meaning up, capnia or capnic, this refers to carbon dioxide. So we're retaining excessive carbon dioxide if we're not exhaling it. Now remember, when the respiratory rate is decreased, carbon dioxide is retained, equaling respiratory acidosis. They are holding on to too much carbon dioxide. And here is a chest tube. Now when covering the site of the chest tube, say when the chest tube dislodges or comes out of place, we are going to want to tape three sides. Three sides should be taped 
because if we fully tape all four sides, this can cause further complications to the situation. So yes, remember, tape three sides. Also, we're gonna wanna maintain, pretty much like a Foley, chest tube drainage system to gravity. As we see, it's attached to the bed in this image, and that's just gonna cause, in the case of a hemothorax, for the fluid to leak downward or get out of the lung. If we put the chest tube up, this is gonna cause backflow, and everything that we're trying to leak will not be going anywhere. So, maintain to gravity, three sides. And here's a close-up of how we're gonna tape the dressing. Again, three sides are to be covered and one side open. Again, this is going to allow air to flow out. And we've reached the end of the presentation. Thank you for tuning in. You can follow this video up with one of the respiratory videos I've placed below. Keep in mind, all of the respiratory videos are a part of a folder that can be accessed in the playlist of the channel. So when you do get a chance, you can go through those videos individually. Thanks again, guys, and I'll see you next time.